Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Martin Reeves. Uh, I'm the facilitator for today's discussion, and uh, I'm I basically lead research for the BCG Henderson Institute for the Boston Consulting Group. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, facilitate a discussion with a very extremely diverse panel, I'd say. Although I'm just going now to ask to introduce themselves. Um, so, Nagaraja, could you begin, perhaps? Yes. Thank you, Martin. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, joining here. I know it's a totally different time zone, so I'm based in New York. Uh, my name is Nagaraja Devi. I'm a managing partner and a senior advisor at the Devi Advisory Group. Um, I specialize in the banking regulations. I advise the corporate boards on the corporate governance and enterprise risk management. And uh, 25 years of experience in the U.S., uh, leading the digital transformation early on with the technology implementation. So I am look forward to um, listening and enjoying the conversation. Wonderful. And uh, uh, Peter, welcome. Could you introduce yourself, please? Well, sure. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Marion. I'm, the fu I'm a futurist and the founder of Future Narrative, a Futures Institute. And um, I'm based out of Melbourne in Australia. And um, I work with companies to help them envision and plan for the future um, and imagine that and build towards it. So lots of research as well, like you, Martin. Yeah, well, that's very appropriate to today's discussion. And uh, Tanya, welcome. Can you introduce yourself? Tanya? You might be on mute, perhaps. I am. Um... My internet seems to be a little bit unstable. Um, my name is Tanya Woods. I'm the founder of Project In Kind and Kind Village, uh, but I'm also a trade negotiator, a nerdy tech lawyer, uh, and a policy strategist that's been working with system players uh, to advance our impact globally and address difficult challenges uh, related to humanitarian crisis, climate crisis, uh, and the changing systems that we're all facing now, uh, now and have been facing for some time due to digitization. It's very nice to be here with you. Yeah, likewise. Um, so let's let's jump in. Let me uh, introduce uh, our focus today. So um, the one constant I think in the world in uh, recent years is a, a fairly frenetic pace of change, and not just continuous change, but discontinuous change. Um, so we've um, in in, uh, in our memories is uh, the disturbance of COVID, and now the disturbance of the Ukraine conflict, and the uh, slower timescale disturbances due to climate change and uh, in, the, in the news very much in the last few days have been uh, some more extreme developments in terms of social polarization and uh, so there's a lot of change for organizations to navigate and um, the one thing we know is that um, change management doesn't work very well um, so depending on how you measure it I mean our research shows that um, about uh, 75% of large scale change, um, and I mean, you know, digital transformation or a cultural shift or uh, a turnaround, we know that those fail in about 75% of cases. And if anything, the changes that are now occurring, um, the digitization of business, the rise of AI and the like, are more complex than the average change. It's not just a case of doing the old stuff a little bit better. You know, it's a case of like doing different things differently with different skills. Um, so that's what we're talking about today, really. Um, so in a word, it's how do we change change? Um, and what do we think we need to change in order to, to change change? And you've got very diverse perspectives on this. So let's kick off with some uh, opening remarks from each of you. So, so Nagaraja, you're a veteran of the financial services industry. And as part of that, you've seen or are seeing right now attempts to embrace the technology revolution, uh, the old waves of that, you know, uh, uh, and also the new waves of uh, crypto and, and quantum and Web 3.0 and so on. Um, so without losing us in the technicalities, what, what, what's, how effective is change in the financial industry? And what's your experience on how we can do better at the problem of change? I would say based in the, the New York City, the financial service industry, they have accepted the change, but the pace is, I would say, much less compared to the Silicon Valley where you based out. But having yeah. said that, the framework that the, uh, the financial institutions working on from the core banking applications, I'm just giving very detailed a little bit, uh, the application that they've been living and breathing was almost 20, 30 years old. 
to keep the change or making a change stick is going to take some time. These are the large financial institutions. There's a regulatory oversight. You have a, a data issues, which the globalization on the cloud applications and new technology innovations. When you look at the entire the stack of applications and the customer experiences where technology is an enabler and how we actually build the ecosystem around is much challenging because the customer uh, expectations are keep changing uh, day to every day, especially the social media activity that has been uh, around in the last few years. Uh, so the roadmap, unless if you properly design and create and the leadership follows at the board level and the C-suite, uh, it will be a challenging aspect in my view. Uh, and the talent management is one of the key aspects to retain, uh, to continue that, to build that culture uh, so that the transition, what you're mentioning about the change uh, will happen. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, unless if you retain the talent, especially during this COVID time, the great resignation that is happening, uh, it will be much more challenging in my view, at least for the next two to three years. Well, th thanks for those uh, opening remarks, uh, Navaraja. Uh, perhaps we can move to uh, to Peter. So your, your business, Peter, is uh, thinking about new futures, uh, and I guess failing to think about them could be one, you know, pathology of yeah. change, and failing to, to get done, to implement the ones that you do come up with could be another. But uh, what would be your observations on, you know, the pathologies of change and how we could, how companies and other institutions need to do better? I mean, I think the big thing in terms of this is that um, a lot of the stuff that we've been seeing change over the last couple of years, particularly with COVID, you know, everyone talks about those things as accelerators of things that were already there. The businesses that have performed well are those businesses that were, or, were already looking into the future and had already started to implement a lot of those shifts. A lot of the businesses that I work with are retailers and particularly in the fashion space. So, you know, the ones that had really embraced those digital shifts already, um, they were the ones that were performing pretty well. And I think what's happening with all of this discontinuity and disruption that we're seeing and expect to see in coming years is that, that a lot of businesses are scrambling. And I think that, you know, because everything is changing so quickly, we're just trying to keep lights on and not really focus on the future because, you know, there's so much emergency happening on a day to day basis. And that's where things start to become problematic in the longer term, because that you're not thinking about those things that might come around the corner and, and adapting for those things as well. And I think that's where when we're seeing things slow down, particularly from an innovation perspective at the moment, because people are so scared and so concerned by what's happening in the immediate space that they're not looking five and 10 years out at the moment. Right. So the, the urgent can distract us from the, uh, the, 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 change, the more fundamental changes. Um, Tanya, you, you bring a very interesting perspective because you, 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 um, you're looking at uh, social uh, issues and the nonprofit sector and uh, presumably some of the, our biggest collective challenges, not just problems of changing a business, but changing society. Um, um, I, I think on your, your website, you talk about um, solving wicked problems using mm -hmm. non-monetary exchanges as well as advanced technology. Um, what would be your observation on how we, you know, there's that which we need to change, but then there's the technology of change itself. How do we need to change how we change? <laughs> um, I appreciate this question. It's definitely not an easy one to address. So Martin, thanks. <laughs> um, changing how we change. I think fundamentally, we each are human beings, first and foremost. So these organizations are not full of robots. They're full of people. Um, all organizations, all systems are full of people. People are the cogs, the wheels, the pulleys, the levers. We are the system. And each of us as individuals brings ourselves to wherever we go. And it sounds very high level perhaps, but it is fundamental. So if we are in a culture that is influenced and driven and, you know, transmitted by fear um, or is being manipulated by, by norms, memes, ideologies that are un, untrue or perhaps off center from reality around us, then we don't know our state of reality. And I, I speak to this in this kind of way because fundamentally we've allowed technologies to evolve very fast. There's There's been a lot of quick movement. 
there's a lot of algorithms, but the algorithms were designed and written by coders and the algorithms are not exactly accurate. The way algorithms move in our lives, we have attention spans of 30 seconds, maybe maybe a minute if it's really interesting. And we're absorbing all cu our culture and, and what we're perceiving to be the culture around us from small screens and certain providers, but we are not absorbing the true culture of humanity around us. And, and this is very important. So when we talk about social issues, grassroots problems, local, local community problems, we've actually become incredibly disconnected as individuals from what that pulse is, what that flow is, what those rhythms are. It means that we're making decisions that are actually uninformed. They're not informed by the reality of day-to-day -day life of the humans around us. They're more informed now by by the small screens and what the algorithms are telling us is trending or is important or is insightful, what have you. This is holding true in every system player, whether it be nonprofit or charity. So part of the work that I've certainly been looking at now for almost a decade, it's just one year shy of a decade, centers on how we understand the needs of people around us, because the needs are the core things people need to survive. And then how we understand what resources are available around us. And so when we are talking about, for example, a climate event, well, how did that impact my neighbor? How did it impact my family member? How did it impact maybe people around me I care about or my work or my colleagues? We don't know that if we don't know their actual individual level needs. And so we are looking at that. But worse is before we get onto fear of scarcity, we need to understand what resources we have around us. So what do we have to solve those concerns, those challenges, those risks. These kind of, um, we'll call them data sets if we're going to speak in tech language, um, or we can just call them knowledge points, which are important for planning, response, etc. That hasn't been systemically, you know, considered the opportunity for business, the opportunity for me as a person, for my neighbor. It's been sort of deferred to governments for so long. And of course, we know government are not keeping up with technological change. So, how do we now amend the social contracts, the social expectations that we have of all the players responsible? So for us, this is the, the space that we're seeing the most opportunity, the most need for attention is thinking through what is actually moving the system? Who's a part of it? Where does the heavy reliance live? You know, on which character? How do we, how do we actually enable people to be both, you know, the conveyor of the message that there's a problem and equally the solution to it. How do you do that? That's just not been our personal way of being. We've trusted state actors. So this is a space where I think we really need to adjust our culture, Martin, um, yeah. and and some kind of high level points, hopefully, to help us advance the conversation today. That's great. Um, no, yeah, I think you make a very good point that the, uh, in some senses, the scientific management paradigm, the um, the focus on what should be done and the and the project management logic of what should be done. Um, uh, neglects um, the uh, what, what uh, the famous economist Frank Knight called the art of change. Namely, there's the the science of change, which you can apply to aluminium heating castings fairly effectively. But the humans, they have motives, they have agency, they have they have different opinions. Um, they don't they don't do what they should do just because you tell them that you should do that. And, and this is uh, this is tremendously important. And um, your point about the lack of community too. I mean, the community that you assume exists. I guess you have the bowling, the bowling alone phenomena, which is, well, maybe that doesn't really exist anymore. It needs to be created or fostered. So the human side of change. Um, I suspect that uh, Paul Sana, um, another panelist, is trying to join. If you are and you can hear us, Paul, um, we can't hear or see you. So you may want to exit and re-enter and turn your camera on. And we'll, uh, we'll introduce you when you manage to get in. Um, so let's uh, let's let's double click on one type of change let's double click on uh, digital or technologically driven change um so virtually every institution out there uh, government companies is trying to um catch up they have this sort of belief that they're behind um that there are you know important applications of technology they um most digital transformations fail too interestingly it's roughly the same number as, as in our analysis about 75 percent um any any observations on key pathologies there? What are the what are the traps in saying I'm going to become the most uh, modern digital bank on earth, uh, Nagaraja? Why is that less straightforward than it seems? Well, it is the lack of understanding. Uh, just because of 
your competitor or a, a bank next door uh, is using the digital transformation or uh, hiring uh, a thousand people as a, a technologist doesn't mean that you actually follow the same path of the competitor. <clears throat> so first understanding what the expectations within uh, both short-term and long-term goals, I think that's the key. And how do you uh, design the culture aspect within the organization? Is the digital transformation is what the expectation from your customers as well as your internal management? If you, if you don't map those two, then it is difficult to create the roadmap. And once you create the roadmap, in my view, understand what your, uh, the key areas of process transformation you're trying to do, your business model transformation, uh, your entire organization culture transformation. And once you identify those three aspects, then you can design or whether to build or buy uh, a technology platform. Uh, I think that's the key right. here. So, so you, in a sense, you're, one of the points you're raising there is the why, which is to what end, because, of course, implementing a technology is not an end in itself. It, it may be actually a very bad end uh, to pursue because um, the reason may not be clear, the extent may not be clear, the competitive implications of trying to imitate what somebody else has already done may not make any sense. So exactly. fundamentally, why are we doing this? Um, absolutely. Um well, any any observations from um, from, from your perspective, uh, uh, Peter? Because I, I guess the you know technology is one of those things that we often construct futures around. You know, mm -hmm. we said we're just going to be different because of technology, um, and we assume that the main means to achieve that is technological. Yet somehow we screw it up. What's the what's what are there any categories of mistake in terms of embracing technology to create new futures? I think people are the thing that people that companies underestimate, right? I mm -hmm. mean, so much around technological change is often, and I, I feel like I'm echoing points already made, but, um, you know, it really comes down to making sure that there's a, a complete and understandable use case for the technology and that it has a need for the customer. And it's not technology for technology's sake. And I think what we're seeing at the moment is um, sort of this two-phase thing when we're looking at some of the transitions towards say web three and and hybrid working or virtual working where you're seeing like lots of different technologies start to emerge but also a lot of pulling back from them as well at the same time which i think we might end up talking about perhaps a little bit later on and i don't want to jump ahead but you know yeah. it's that thing of like really understanding why people use technology and how they use it and and whether they're ready for it and making sure that they're coming along if that uh, transition, particularly in like, you know, a workplace environment or a governmental environment, um, that they understand their value to them and it's not something that's being imposed upon them that's going to take away some of perhaps their autonomy or their jobs potentially. And I think that that kind of creating that narrative and working in partnership with the people that you're working with is really important, but also really understanding the complexity of the use case as well and making sure that things, I mean, some of the things that where technology fails is because, you know, uh, someone has come in from uh, to implement a technology solution and doesn't understand the complexity of the systems yeah. already being made and things like that. Well, of course, um, we have a, general, a generational issue as part of that, um, namely, um, you know, who is the generation that wasn't brought up to use these technologies we're trying to implement as second nature? The very top of the organization, the people that are running the running the change. Um, is that is that part of the problem, uh, part of the human problem that you refer to, uh, Tanya? Um, definitely, that's an aspect of it, but I think it's even it's even deeper. Um, and, and this is how what we're observing is if I make you the, you know, the widget or the tool to enable you to do more yourself, how many of those widgets or tools can I give to you as one person to absorb through how many different processes of your life? And, you know, it can be a bit much. And this is something that we, we have not really thought through at a broader broader level. How many Zoom calls can one human being do in a day on the back of how many emails being answered through how many texts through how many Instagram videos through how many readings of the digital paper on top? Like ultimately the whole day becomes digital absorbed by all these widgets. And did you brush your hair? You know, and did you see your family? Did you look at the sky? 
And mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, that's a big part of this. That's, that's one aspect. The other is, you know, what does this thing, this new widget, what does it mean for me? I think you bring about many of the questions certainly I have run into even dealing heavier with government and with the not-for-profit charity space. You know, aside from losing my job, aside from perhaps, you know, being irrelevant, am I ready to make my organization redundant? Is that a good thing? And the critical thinking skills that are actually required to make these assessments have been a bit left behind. I mean, we've kind of forgot to teach critical thinking. And in truth, we need to be critically thinking about every single widget we're layering in and what it means for a greater greater systemic impact. So if we make if we make hyper efficiencies leveraging tech in the not-for-profit space, we also have to take account for the fact that the third sector makes up a sizable quantity of most GDPs. Right. So, you know, what then, right? What then? We can solve the problems, but what then? <laughs> Interesting point. So that, you know, that that barrier, that production possibility frontier of humans, you know, what we what can we reasonably do? How many tools, how many processes, how much information processing? I mean, you know, I think I think we'd all agree that we're you know, we're somewhere close to that limit, you know, probably couldn't fit in another 10 Zoom calls a day or process even more emails. Yeah. Um, and um, so is, is that in a sense about viewing change more holistically and, and through a more human through a more human lens? Because it's almost as if the assumption is whatever should be done, no matter how complex or voluminous, you know, it shall be done. And I think we're at a level of complexity where that uh, that may not be the case. Is, is that essentially your point, Tanya? It, it really is. I mean, I've, I made a comment about this uh, in an article I wrote back at the very start of the pandemic. And I said, you know, ob just observing all of these things, frankly, I think we need a digital human rights convention or agreement amongst all of us. And I, I also believe it must mandate digital downtime because we see this. We see the results now. We are not out seeing the sky. We're not out seeing each other as much. And as a result, mental health has become, you know, I think at all time crisis levels. And, and I do think some of this is new. And I certainly think some of it is perpetuated by all the widgets, if you will. We forgot to take into account the needs of our own humanity. <laughs> right. Um, so so we, and we've talked about difficulties of change in general. Let's let's maybe shift a little bit to leading change. Um, so it seems to me that the, the main approach that we have to change is a sort of a project management based approach, you know, uh, deduce what needs to be done and you know, take a goal, deduce what needs to be done, um, you know, break it down into pieces and, uh, you know, monitor whether people are doing it with a few incentives thrown in along the way, which sounds very logical. Um, you know, I think I think Gantt charts very well work very well for. Uh, you know, managing a construction project or something. They don't appear to be that effective in terms of managing how people um, think and behave. Um, what, what's the alternative, though? I mean, how, how might we reconceive the tools of change or the approaches to change? Um, Nagaraja, any any thoughts on that? If it isn't a if it if it is a Gantt chart, what 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 is it? A, a, a change process? The, the in my view, as Tanya pointed. Uh, in the early days of COVID, um, the, the digital transformation, or the entire technology transformation, I would say, using your social media, your Zoom connections, and, and literally living and breathing in the, in the closet for 24 by 7 to be more productive, uh, is taking a toll on that. I think that mindset has to be changed, in my view, because is sitting on a Zoom call is really that productive. And people argue that, saying we need to be stepping out of the house and go to the offices, and that's a different thought process again, because uh, you based out in Silicon Valley, and the most technology companies in Silicon Valley are not accepting that you should come back to the offices. Some of them, the yeah. lot of Well, I observe a very interesting paradox in that respect. So I'm, I'm not from Silicon Valley, but I now live in Silicon Valley. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's interesting. I... The, the rest of the world appears to see technology as some sort of um, nirvana to be to be uh, pursued to a maximal extent. Um, out here, you know, you see these events which are like medieval fairs where there's this 
by the very sort of founders of technology, almost a rejection of technology. You know, they're wandering around in sort of leather sandals and stopping their kids playing with iPads. And, uh, you know, so, so the, you know, the founders of the digital revolution are not necessarily drinking the Kool-Aid. They, you know, ironically, they may have a more human perspective on, on technology. Well, I, that's what I completely agree with Tanya's point of you need to have a digital downtime if you want to be come back to normal human being lifestyle style that we want to retain, uh, not to be completely become a, a robotic arms um, sitting in front of the laptops and the right. systems. So I think we might have be, been joined by Paul. You, is that you there, Paul? Yes, it is. You hear me? Hi, Paul. Welcome. I'm sorry you had trouble getting on. Um, would you like to briefly introduce yourself and, and, um, and then uh, I'll ask you to if you have any perspectives on the question we're discussing right now, which is, um, you know, you could treat change like project management. We know that doesn't work very well. What's the alternative? So, so if you could introduce yourself briefly, first of all. Sure. I, I run a uh, private equity firm called the SS Capital, and, and I have a uh, tech background from everything from uh, e-commerce to cloud. So uh, I, I have uh, about 18 years experience in, in business. Excellent. So, um, you know, we've, we've just had a discussion about you know, change not working particularly well in spite of being very pervasive. Um, um, and so we have this sort of default, you know, the project management department says this is how you should change. That doesn't work very well. Any any alternatives that you've seen to managing change more effectively or framing change more effectively? Uh, I, I think uh, from like a larger organization standpoint, uh, maybe if you have somebody... Uh, like a chief digital officer that, that would be able to explain it properly and, and get the company to accept it in an employee adoption that's there to advance the employees, um, you know, retool their current staff is a better way of looking at adoption than change because right. change just doesn't work, right? That's the whole point of changing something. But right. you, you can get everybody to... I'm sorry, sorry you're saying, I understand. You're saying focus less on what should be done and focus more on the persuasion of... Um, you know, why, why is this interesting? Uh, sort of, I guess that's more about narrative and appeal, uh, a more human way of managing change. Is that, is that the idea? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that would be uh, correct, yes. Um, Peter, I'm not sure how you manage change on your your sort of visionary projects, but do you do you approach change in a different way to, to try to, you know, more effectively implement it? Are you, is it about creating excitement about the future, or what? What, you, what are your change levers that are the alternative to this, this very logical but not particularly effective project management approach that we have? Yeah. So a lot of the projects that I'm looking at have like a five, ten, even further, you know, a, a, a long horizon on them, and so a lot of that is really, like you say, it is about inspiring people and making people feel excited about a possible future because I mean obviously what we're seeing at the moment with all of this discontinuity and change that we're experiencing is that there is that real sense of fear about the future and and concern about what that might look like you know all of the data that's coming out from you know even from the world risks report are saying that you know a lot of those experts are very scared of it and very concerned about the future so it's like how do we start to make people feel empowered and feel like they're in control of what their future might look like which obviously control is such a, a strong a, a problematic word perhaps but like you know making people feel like they are you know the master of their own destinies a little bit more rather than having the change happen to them that they're they're driving the change themselves yeah i had a very interesting story the other day about the software company the pre-internet software company uh, intuit that uh, had a philosophy that leaders um could only do one thing on on innovation projects and that was they could remove obstacles that was the only thing they were allowed to do they, they, they were not in this uh, in this sort of uh, controlling and telling uh, position because um, they'd concluded that, that that isn't particularly effective and uh, it was linked to the philosophy of uh, um, the projects which are most successful are the ones that have most chances to evolve the ones that have most chances to evolve are the ones that people want to evolve is that is that mm -hmm. consistent 
with your your perspective, um, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. And if we start to think about some of the things that are happening right now, I mean, you know, we're looking at obviously we've had some um, big transitions over the last few years. We work from home, you know, that that transition to working from home, and then you know suddenly we've got these devaluations in companies like Zoom. Right, their their share price has just dropped beneath what it was in 2020, and so people are now using that as you know, well, the work from home experience uh, experiment has failed, and everyone's going back to the office. And it's not that's not that's not what's happening. It's just that there was such a high expectation that that expectation has now been lowered. Similarly. You know, we've seen drip dips in NFTs and some Web3 three things in cryptocurrencies. And obviously, like, you know, cryptocurrencies are a whole other area that I don't want to get into today. But, you know, looking at those things rather than seeing the news cycle and going, oh, well, that's, a, that's over now. That's done. That technology is done. Thinking about it in a longer term perspective and thinking that this is part of that technology adoption type cycle rather than thinking really, really problematically in a very short term way. So I've talked about... Um obstacles to change we've talked about technologies of change um let's maybe shift to, to to another problem which is um the interesting thing about our biggest change problem um climate change is that it's actually a collective change problem uh, logically so we're not trying to change one part of the system you know one of the big assumptions of scientific management is you break things down into parts and you work on the parts um i you know my belief is that you for, for, a, for a, a problem, um, um, maybe, maybe uh, Tanya, you're sure I'd have a wicked problem, a problem where the problem depends upon what the agents do towards the problem. The problem changes as a result of mutual behaviors and interactions. Mm-hmm. You can't break it down to pieces and say, pursue your net zero goals and all will be solved. You have to somehow motivate collective change. That's, that's very complicated. Um, I, I, what do we know about collective change? Because it seems to me that a lot of your... Your, your projects are uh, in, in in that direction. You're addressing common, you know, commonwealth problems, as it were. What's your what's your perspective on collective change? Yeah, collective change has so much to do about culture and how we can influence culture. Um, it's it's not about the little pieces as you've identified, because you have to get all the stakeholders toward the same page. And I mean, I've had successes and failures in in most interesting you know spaces on collective change initiatives that I've worked on over the years and you know in one case I was able to bring an entire set of industries and a government to the table to build out a digital skills narrative which which is what Canada did where I'm based um, back in 2017 they, the government funded it the business was aligned people were excited because they wanted the jobs and all of those kind of core stakeholders that had I'm sorry to interrupt you, Tanya, but why did that work? Was that because yeah. you leaned on the tool of the collective narrative? Or like, what, why? Because it's kind of a pretty hard thing, right? You know, a whole bunch of interests yeah. that got something done. What, what was the su- success there? You have to find the motivation of each of the stakeholders and see how you can stitch it together in an aligned narrative. And we, we did play with short-term and long-term narratives. We said, you know, this is a short-term solution in in one way which we we basically changed immigration laws to achieve that and in another way there's a longer term narrative here where we initiated a bunch of education and funding initiatives to upskill reskill and actually create skills for all demographics so it, it was taken as a very holistic approach and then it was put in context um of the global environment and so Canada is a is a large geographic space, but it's also a very small uh, population. I mean, we fit all of us into California with some space. And so how does a nation like ours still matter in a digital world, right? How does that happen? And so we, we played on all of the different motivations of all the stakeholders to sort out how we would go to the world, how would we go all the way down to the individual level into the homes where we were saying, look, we want children to come to the table and learn some of these skills so they have a chance to participate in our future in a meaningful way should they choose to. It took, it took, I mean, a couple of years, but that's pretty fast. In the case of, you know, looking at aid and um, their uh, philanthropic efforts, you know, I focused heavily on, all right, if we run out of cash money, then how are we going to help each other? Because right now the system is set up that government gives cash to charities and charities figure it out and distribute it to people. But we saw back in the 2008 financial crisis, a number of charities fell to pieces. A number of social banks in Europe collapsed. They never came back. And and this is much harder. It's not a fail point, but it's just much harder because not enough people with enough motivation are buying into it. So so it'll come. It'll come slowly. Um, so we're approaching the end of our time. Maybe we could just go around the table and um, 
and I want to ask you a question on uh, practical advice for leaders. So let's uh, let's imagine that we're advising um, uh, the the chief executive of a of a charity or a company facing a colossal change problem. Um, let's say they're facing the combination of digital competition uh, combined with rethinking their business in the climate up upheaval, colossal. Um, so, you know, they're going to go about that, all the technicalities of that. But um, in terms of being affected a leader in that situation, what what one or two things would you advise them to bear in mind? So maybe two minutes from each of you. Um, starting with uh, with you, Paul, what, what would be your advice to a CEO leading a, a change project from hell, as it were? Uh, I think uh, the easiest way to do it really is uh, educating your staff on the goals that are, are there, you know, and, and getting them familiar with some of the terminologies and where their place will be once that change is adopted. I think that's the biggest fear factor you have to solve. Right. Yeah, it reminds me of a, of a very uh, um, misguided project I saw once, fortunately not one of our own, but um, essentially the uh, all of the executives were assembled in a room and they had to figure out um, who to fire. And um, it makes perfect sense, except that people getting fired might include them. You know, we forgot the interests of the participants. What does it mean? What does it mean to the people in the change process? So I, I thought that was quite a quite an interesting uh, oversight. Um, Nagaraja, what about you? you? I'm sure you've actually seen this uh, for real in financial services. Um, advice to a, uh, a CEO leading a complex change project? Uh, in my view, the senior leadership or the CEOs uh, must take the ownership and become accountable. Uh, that drives the change. And, and, the, and the entire C-speed or the board will rally with the chief executive if he or she takes the ownership. Uh, what does that mean, take, taking ownership? Well, I understand the sentiment, but what would they do differently as a result of taking ownership, for example? Well, it's, it's the organizational change. Uh, he or she has to be on. Uh, for example, you're talking about the change from the ESG. It is not just a service, but it has to become from appointing a chief sustainable officer to begin with and run the strategy from the ESG point of view and what impacts the ESG. Because the end of the day, it's the reputational impact and it might even cost the, the CEO uh, his or her job. So right. okay. uh, that's the accountability and the ownership I'm, I'm talking about because that's a future change. Thank you. Uh, so Peter, supposing that you are, um, you've just done a wonderfully rousing speech on the future to one of your clients and uh, the CEO says, piece of cake, I'm going to get this done. And you're advising, no, no, this is not so straightforward. You've got to, you've got to remember this, this, and this. What would those those things, uh, the difference between thinking the right thoughts and actually getting it done, what would be some really major things that are often overlooked? Um, I think it's really about, um, yeah, the employee buy-in and buy-in of all of the stakeholders in a project, obviously. And I think the other part of this is, you know, thinking about some of these positive changes. Obviously, people do want to be sustainable. So if you're thinking about any kind of sustainability project, those are things that actually employees might be quite excited to get behind. So, like, let's not just, you know, think about change being a negative thing all of the time, because I, I do think that, you know, employees do want to be feeling like they're part of positive solutions. So don't underestimate that and don't underestimate the fact that there can be positive aspects to change as well. But really it is about stakeholder buy-in and making sure people that are coming along a journey with you. Tanya, you, you, you lead these complicated collective change projects. I mean, what, 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 are the, what are the things you're observing great change leaders do that are less obvious and not so widespread? Um, I have three. Uh, first, seek, and, seek to clarify and understand the values uh, and priorities of the community that you need to solve and be part of the change with you. Um, and I think that builds on what, what Peter said. Um, second, seek to achieve what clear consensus would look like. So get clear on what consensus would look like, and that's, that's a harder thing to do. And then the third is uh, to be humble and support critical thinking and discovery of all the options to support the change you're trying to do, including the ones you may or may not like, um, and then aim to align them to the consensus and the values of the community. I think if you can achieve that, it's hard. If you can do it, you can you can lead forward and then check back in often with the community to see how it's going and how they're taking and perceiving it. 
just to double, double click on one aspect of that this you know one of the uh one of the words i hear a lot in this respect is alignment you know so are, are we aligned and yeah. you know it has it has a positive connotation which is um you know have we have we achieved a consensus momentum to change it has a slightly um menacing aspect too you know are you are you aligned because if you don't think what you're supposed to be thinking you know, bad things could happen to you. It's almost like a mafia threat or something. Any, any, any observations on how to think about the problem of alignment? I'll just say for alignment, I mean, think of it as tires, you know. If we can, if we are really listening, uh, you know, and it comes with, with everybody deciding, yes, we are aligned, right? It's an attempt at somewhat, <laughs> somewhat of a democracy. Um, but if we can sort it out, your car won't crash. <laughs> but the right. alignment has to be checked in on regularly right we're not just we don't just align and then stay aligned we have to go in for tune-ups we have to we have to check it in you know sometimes if, 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 if I, try, I just try to think of, a, of an antonym for alignment it might be diversity for example um, i like i like that one too <laughs> great awesome. well thank you uh this this brings us to the end of our time thank you to our wonderful panelists i i hope this this has been uh, useful and uh to the audience and uh, do reach out to any of us uh, if you have any uh, observations, disagreements, questions or suggestions. So thank you again to Paul and to Nagaraja and to, uh, to Peter and to Tanya. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Thanks. everyone.